Off we go. Opening, new episode, let's go. driving on a beautiful dirt road in the south of Mozambique. We're not too far away from the Kruger National Park. We've been at Karangani Game Reserve and we are currently on our way to the Maputo Special Reserve. When I say we, I mean myself. Um, Michelle Campbell from Wild Wonderful World and Quentin and Dion from Iron Man 4x4. We are going to Maputo Special Reserve because Michelle and Grant have raised some money for elephant collars and we are delivering a collar to the people of Elephants Alive. And I'm very excited that we are gonna maybe get a few days to spend with them and learn about their conservation efforts. And I'm really hoping that we'll get to meet both Michelle Henley and Dr. Lucy King big, big heroes in conservation when it comes to Ellie conservation. And just to learn a little bit more about human-elephant conflict, because that is a problem. Wherever there's a rural area with people living and they have, you know, like livestock and crops that they live from, elephants tend to also like some of the things that we plant to eat. And you can't teach an elephant just not to eat your mealies because you planted them. So there's always a, a level of conflict where there are wild elephants and people living in close proximity to each other. But luckily, there are a bunch of really smart scientists who are trying their best to come up with solutions for this problem. Coffee break. I'm very excited to be moving onwards to our next operation, to our next game reserve. We are heading south, driving via Maputo to Maputo Special Reserve. And we are continuing our elephant journey in Maputo Special Reserve, connecting with Elephants Alive again to see if we can collar another elephant and specifically one that is causing some issues and conflict problems with local communities in the area. So a huge amount to look forward to still. We only had about 400 kilometers to drive to Maputo Special Reserve, but if you've ever driven in rural Africa, you'll know that you can't really estimate travel time by distance. So we left very early and we were prepared to spend the entire day traveling. That's a really long train. Maputo is quite infamous for the high levels of corruption among some traffic cops that bully tourists into paying hefty bribes. Unfortunately, we have to drive through Maputo, but it is not a place anyone likes driving, so we are driving like Sutkinish. 60, not a kilometre over 60, not a single wheel touching a solid line. <laughs> We're just hoping for the best. I've even heard about someone who was fined for having their elbow out the window. So I'm too scared to open the windows. We're all driving with our windows up through the city. That was extremely cool. I did not know that we were gonna cross that new bridge in Maputo. It is fancy pants.
So we've arrived at the Maputo Special Reserve and we've deflated our tires to 1.5 bar because we're driving sand roads and it's about an hour to two hours to camp and it's already almost four o'clock so I reckon we'll only get there like just before dark but I'm expecting a beautiful road let's see Driving through Maputo Special Reserve is quite unexpected actually. I expected the sand and the sand dunes, but the terrain was really exciting. It felt like an adventure from the gate all the way to the campsite. And I mean, we were in low range, diff lock, four by four and tires deflated. I mean, we, we feel like we're proper adventurers moving through this terrain. is a beautiful road very bumpy just like a only a sand road can be but stunning it's my first time in this reserve and it reminds me a lot of cozy bay area and ponta malungan except the vegetation looks quite different and i'm assuming it's because it's a protected area and maybe not as grazed oh it's so good to be here The contrast in the bush as well is incredible. You've got the dunes and the coast on one hand, and then vast plains, savannas, flays, there's lakes everywhere. It is a stunningly beautiful reserve. So after Karangani, I didn't know how we would possibly top that for the rest of the trip, but this place is <laughs> changing my mind. We couldn't have chosen a more contrasting reserve to Karangani and Limpopo National Park for this expedition. So it's been great to see both terrains and, and both reserves. It's a beautiful sunset. This park is just stunning. So we've arrived, uh, we're just checking in at the camp gate and it is dark, we are going to be setting up tent in the dark, but that's fine, I just saw a little glimpse of the ocean over the dune, so I'm hoping we'll be quite close to the sea, that will be really cool. Good morning. Um, I think everyone is awake. Um, let me show you the camp. That's my house. This is where Dion lives. Michelle and Quentin. This campsite is beautiful. Hey, sunshine. <laughs> Good morning. How did you sleep? Yeah. Very well, and you? Good. I slept so well listening to the swamp night jar, calling all night, and then I just had the world's hottest shower. Feeling good. I honestly think this is one of the nicest campsites I've ever camped at. It's got very luxurious kitchen. Sorry. 
very nice ablutions. So we're going to just all jump in the iron van and drive to the beach to have a coffee on the beach and then we'll come back to camp and plan our day. This is just absolutely magnificent. There's not even a breeze. It's just white, pristine beach, no litter. There's one plastic bottle, we'll pick it up. Oh, this is amazing. This reserve was established in 1960 to protect the elephant population in the region, and it was originally named the Special Elephant Reserve. In 1969, it was renamed as Maputi Special Reserve to highlight the conservation status beyond just elephants. That's really not bad. It's a little bit cold, but it's warmer than Cape Town Sea. By 2019, more than 4,600 animals had been translocated into the park including eight species that had become locally extinct during the country's 16 years civil war. This place is so nice and Michelle had a little walk to see um, how far our campsite is from the beach and it's right there. It's right there. There's a beautiful constructed set of wooden steps from our campsite right down to the beach. So we're going to go and get all of our beach stuff. And we are having a like a leisure day today, so we're gonna chill on the beach, yeah. read, swim. Ooh, are you guys excited? Super excited. You've been looking for, looking for someone who brings you breakfast in bed and does a mess with your head. Historically, elephants would move freely between KwaZulu Natal and southern Mozambique, but during the Mozambican War, these elephants suffered greatly from setting off landmines and getting caught in snares set for smaller game. So to safeguard them on the South African side, the northern border of Tembe Elephant Park was fenced in 1989. Unfortunately, this move cut the elephant population in half. Against all odds, the elephants in Maputo Special Reserve were able to survive the civil war and are now flourishing. The last game count revealed a population of over 400 elephants that graze in large herds on the open floodplains or explore the thick dune forests. You don't wanna be, wanna be left out. You wanna feel something real with someone who knows what you need. But I know that these days it ain't always easy to get what you're looking for. You think I let you down, break your heart and play around. But that's not me. I don't know how busy it usually gets here but we are the only people here and it is just amazing to have a day on the beach. This rocks, I love it. It's my favorite place in the world is the beach. And just knowing that we're in a reserve and there's wildlife all around in the coastal forest, it's amazing. And it's also whale season so we're keeping an eye out for some, what do you call it? splashes on the horizon when they push the water out of the blowhole. I think our off day was very well needed. It's not very often that we get the opportunity to disconnect where there's no cell phone signal. There's absolutely no ways that you can even try and do any work, even on the side. and it really reinforces how important it is to disconnect and take a day to enjoy the time and the space and the environment around you. So spending a bit of time on the beach and walking those beautiful sand dunes and reading a book, it's, it's been a, a very special few days. We've had such a lovely leisurely day and now we are going out for a game drive 
and I need to put the GamePro on the car so we can get some nice shots of the animals. I'm hoping we'll see some. We did see some zebra and wildebeest and a giraffe yesterday, so they're definitely animals. Oh, and buffalo. We saw buffalo as well. So let me get this up and then we'll go for a drive. And hopefully late tonight we'll meet up with the people from Elephants Alive who are on their way today and we'll see what the plan is for the next couple of days. We had an awesome afternoon and sundowner on the lake here in Maputo Special Reserve and we were expecting to see the Elephants Alive team when we got back to camp but unfortunately we heard that they have been delayed possibly at a border. We don't have any cell phone reception or signal and the only reason that we know this is because we had a very special surprise when we got back and that was seeing the helicopter when we pulled in and Grant is here so he's been doing some flying with um, Maputi Special Reserve to do some human wildlife conflict stuff and he told us that Elephants Alive team has been delayed so yeah hopefully we'll catch up with them tomorrow morning but in the meantime we've got Grant. <laughs> <laughs> that is intimidating. You can tell me um, <laughs> how was your flight in? Uh, beautiful beautiful flight in. Saw some elephants in the elephant reserve, so tick. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Once fun, no bye. Later. Later. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning! Thank goodness Grant was here with the chopper last night because that meant we had a radio that could connect us to someone at the gate who could connect us to Elephants Alive and we've just got a message that we are to meet them at the gate I think so it's an hour and a half's drive and we're quickly just repacking everything going in the van so we can leave all the camping stuff behind. Morning, morning, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Quentin's car has become my toolbox and storage space so that I can take everyone in the van. Morgen Bjorn. Morgen, morgen, morgen. We're going to go to Lekker, lekker. Just quickly getting snacks. Dion is packing snacks for us because we have to um, prioritize. And Michelle was going to do flapjacks for breakfast before we had to rush. I wish she is now, but she's doing it anyway. Okay, that is fun. Just check this campsite again. It's really awesome, I love it. There's the star of the show. Hi! Flapjacks in the morning! Yeah, we're we trying. We've got like, this is going to be five minute flapjacks on the go. <laughs> we can eat them in the car though on our way. Probably check them out or burn them to pieces. This is going to be a poor representation. So where are we going? We're going to go across to the headquarters of um, the Putu Special Reserve. We're going to have a meeting with the vet, Jao, and then hopefully connect with the Elephants Alive team. I have a feeling they've gone straight there um, rather than coming to the campsite first. So yeah, we'll go and figure out what's going to go on for the day. Um, hopefully we'll learn something about the elephant colouring. I know that the helicopter is only here today, so let's see. Tell me the collar that you got. Yes. Do you still have that or do they have that? No, so we bought one across the border and then they've bought one across okay. the border. That first one we deployed was the one that we had. Okay. So we actually can't do anything without them being here because they've got the collar. 
so we do have to wait for them. Um, Obviously, it's not like we know how to just dart an elephant. No, what I mean, the vet's here, the vet's here, and the helicopter's here. Okay. It's the elephant's alive team, which I'm, ha I'm guessing we're going to meet them there at the, at the headquarters. Because we just got the radio message about going for a meeting, so... Yeah, exciting times today. Now I understand. Yes. Elephants Alive is a South African-based NGO, and they focus on elephant research and pioneering new data and studies on elephant behavior and also ways to mitigate human-elephant conflict. Uh, I first came into contact with them whilst living in Hoodsprate. They are a local NGO in the area and they do a huge amount of work in the Kruger and Greater Kruger area to, to learn more about elephant movement. Um, so we've done a lot of work with them previously to help them collar elephants and we also support their bees, trees and elephant project where they're using bees to help save iconic tree species in the Greater Kruger National Park. Uh, and this was based off of initial research by Dr. Lucy King. And I'm not vouching for the fact that they cooked in the middle because this was a proper rush job. Let's get a flip Mmm. Look, could do with some honey, but honey in the car whilst driving on sandy roads is yeah. not a good idea. <laughs> it's not. Want one? Please. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. Michelle Henley heads up Elephants Alive, and she has dedicated her entire research life to focusing on elephants. Um, the papers, scientific papers that she's written and data that she's collected and studies that she has pioneered has helped save elephants in the Southern African region. And we are very, very excited and thankful to be working with her with these elephant collarings. Hi, Hi. Alti, so nice to meet you. Alti. Yes, very nice to, nice to meet you. Hi, Michelle, very nice to meet you. Hi, Hi. Alti. Hi, Jess. So nice to meet you all. Through collaring elephants through the years, we've, we've discovered this amazing corridor where elephants are linking Kruger National Park with the Futi Corridor, um, which obviously links to the coastal population of elephants in Maputo Special Reserve. And we hope that we can build in long-term mitigation strategies and diminish human-elephant conflict in certain zones. And that would mean either people protect their crops by having beehive fences, or they start growing elephant unpalatable crops to buffer their corn crops. So those are the long-term mitigation strategies. But the short-term strategy, when we realised what an amazing route these elephants are forging, but how dangerous it is, we, we quickly um, sort of scurried and partnered with Elephant Crisis Fund to get, a, and the JAMA International Foundation, to get a rapid response unit off the ground, together with Mozambique Wildlife Alliance. And um, what that involves at this stage is we've got two elephant shepherds that have a, a motorbike and they follow where, you know, when we know those elephants are moving into a conflict zone, they've got these toolkits that Mozambique Wildlife Alliance um, started developing, which just involves crackers and various mitigation strategies that they deploy to chase the elephants out of conflict zones. So that's the, the short-term mitigation strategies, this um, reactive unit that just immediately tries to prevent um, human elephant conflict and ensure human safety because that's really very critical. Grant was out with the heli actually darting a hippo this morning so we've been waiting around so we've had a little bit of time to spend here um, and I just sat down and did an interview with Michelle and with Lucy and that has been <laughs> um, a very very special experience for me just getting their take on things um, and then I think it's the hour of truth, we'll go dart that early. So um, Dr. Lucy King did her PhD um, using bees and um, developing this beehive fence to protect crops, which is amazing because, you know, once you've got a beehive fence, you've got the pollination services of the bees, but you're also protecting the crops and you're um, supplying honey and other honey related products that people can sell for money. So she's the real queen of that incredible concept. And we're really fortunate to have her with us on this expedition. 
um, and she's come to help us plan where we will use bees as a mitigation strategy in this corridor. So um, really, really blessed to be working with Lucy King and she also helped us through the Elephant Crisis Fund um, to get this rapid response unit off the ground um, to protect these corridor moving elephants. So we discovered that elephants are scared of honeybees, which is just a David and Goliath story from the fables of, of the past. And it, it is actually a Kenyan folklore. So we listened to these herders who told us the story and we did a number of experiments um, uh, about 15 years ago to really explore the science. Is this true or is it just an old wives' tale? Anyway, it turns out that's what my PhD was all studying and it, you play bee sounds to elephants and they run fast away. And not only do they run, but they head shake and they dust themselves to knock the bees out of the air. Uh, so I had a fantastic four or five years working with Save the Elephants in the middle of the bush in Kenya, doing these experiments, trying to understand uh, the psychology of the elephants and how they understood that, that that bee sound was a threat. Trying to understand how a bee could sting an elephant it seems ridiculous. Uh, and of course, elephant skin are two centimeters thick. So it turns out they're not stinging them through the skin. They're actually stinging them around the eyes and the mouth and the watery areas. So they're attracted to that watery zone and their skin can swell. And of course, if they get stung up the trunk, you can imagine that's pretty graphic and pretty horrible. So elephants only need to be stung once for them to remember that sound or the smell, and they will stay away from that location. So we've turned this idea of elephants being scared of bees into a practical application. And that comes in many forms, but the main one that I'm working on is installing beehives around farmers' fields to provide a beehive fence to stop elephants entering the field. So the beehives are connected one to the other all the way around the boundary of a farm. And if an elephant tries to push through, he always avoids the beehives, but he will try and push through between the wire that links it. And it causes all the hives to swing, releasing the bees, and it creates this natural deterrent. And so this, uh, it's a biological deterrent really, natural biological deterrent, and it's working really well. And so we've been trialing it in many countries, it's in 20 countries right now, four in Asia and the rest in Africa. And we've trialed it in Mozambique with success. So we're out here at the moment seeing whether we could put in some beehive fences along this special elephant corridor to see if that could bring some harmony to the situation out here with elephants walking through this extraordinary valley um, and causing conflict along the way. I don't exactly know what's going on because suddenly there's like a hell of a lot of people and we're convoying towards the airstrip. I've lost, I don't know what's going on at all anymore, but Michelle okay. is super excited. I'm so excited. We are in convoy with the vet. Well, there's actually two vets on site now. Um, with the Elephants Alive team, both the South African side and the Mozambican side. We've also got Ivan Carter and his team who are here in Mozambique filming for a documentary and doing a lot for conservation as well, which he's one of my idols. It's super, super exciting to be a part of this, this project and operation with him as well. And what we're gonna do is we're heading closely towards a herd of elephants that are just outside the reserve fence what they're hoping to do is push the herd into the reserve side now this is a herd that they have massive issues with human wildlife conflict and so basically they want to get a collar on them because it is going to be used as an early warning signal sign um, to help keep that herd safe and the people safe of course so yeah, we basically rushing through the nearest gate to stand by on the fence line in case they go either way and then we're going to try and get in with the vehicles on the ground. Luckily we're in a lack of 4x4, so we stand a good chance. That was very quick, we literally just pulled off the side of the road and we just heard the dart is already in and here's Grant coming back with the chopper. When the elephant's been darted, okay. you look for certain signs that the drugs are starting to show. Um, it could be the tail lifting up, the ears start to move, um, obviously they start to move from side to side and then they can say, okay, right, she's starting to show signs. Um, and then they'll do a final little bit of ushering to get it to the place where they need it to be. And then she'll go down, or he will go down. Do you reckon that's what's happening now? That's what's happening now. So you'll see that the helicopter's pulled all the way up. Um, so just waiting for it to show signs. As she shows signs, they'll come down. Because they don't want them to run and get exhausted and get hot. Yeah. Because it puts too much pressure on the elephant's body. Well, there's the heli. Mm, he's gone. And they'll be trying pretty hard. 
hard now to get those Ellie's on the right side of the fence. You can see he's like pushing them a little bit. Well, giving them encouragement. Getting ready to run. Window, go, window, go, window, go. Human elephant coexistence is a huge challenge. That's our entire aim of my program at Save the Elephants. Uh, with Elephants Alive, Mozambique Wildlife Alliance, we're trying really hard to find solutions. And the hard reality is there is no one solution. You can't even just put up electric fences and that's the solution because they often break, they're not maintained well, they're super expensive. So what we're working on is a toolbox. And the toolbox is literally you open up a box and there's just a ton of different methods in there and you have to go to each site and work out which tool works for that location. And it could be a different environmental challenge, it could be a different elephant population, it could be different bee species, it could be different soils. And so that's the challenge, is working out what's appropriate in which site. Uh, and that's what we're doing out here at the moment. It's a very valuable exercise to collar these elephants because it gives us a glimpse of their world and how they're navigating through um, a human-dominated landscape. And these corridors are really important in terms of connecting protected areas. So, you know, we've got the national parks, but it's amazing that we've got this connectivity between them because that also keeps the genes flowing. Um, so, you know, there's some really big tusked elephants in the Kruger National Park and Maputo Special Reserve They've got um, much smaller tusks, so now it's really good to know that potentially the genes of the Kruger population are still reaching this coastal population. And it also, um, you know, if you've got a corridor, it allows you to sort of look at longer term strategies in terms of mitigating human elephant conflict. And if you start working towards a coexistence corridor, that's when you give ownership to the people that are living with elephants but you empower them to be able to deal with potential conflict situations. And then hopefully, you know, people can see that they living with wildlife is a bonus and not a burden, and that's really important. And, you know, through beehive fences or growing unpalatable crops or even potential tourism coming to a community-owned coexistence corridor, that's how people can see there's actually benefits when these elephants move through their landscapes. And we feel that's really important, but we wouldn't know about that if it wasn't for the collars. We would never have known that Kruger elephants are moving so deeply into Mozambique. And that's why it's so important to be able to get that visibility. And it also becomes an individual animal with a story. It's not just an elephant when you fit an elephant with a collar. So very exciting times and we're very grateful to be here. I used to fall apart Lose myself and give my heart away Come and go in shady places mm -hmm. I used to sit and stare It's taken 40 years, blood, sweat, and tears. The collar itself is, feels to a human quite cumbersome. Um, they're heavy. The collar itself, 
with the satellite on the top and then adding a counterweight underneath. Um, it's a heavy piece of equipment and it has to be heavy and durable because it needs to last four or so years. So there's a very thick strap involved with it. It's nuts and bolts to hold it on. I mean, you're not gonna be able to tie a bow around an elephant's neck and expect it to stay there. So you're literally tightening the nuts and bolts around this collar to make sure that it stays on. Every dance has its pace Interlace, intertwine now You can't save time Collaring elephants is, is one of those things that none of us particularly like to do. It's an absolutely essential tool. Um, we don't do it for fun. You know, it's hard work, it's scary. We, we, the elephants are at risk, the humans are at risk, your vehicles are at risk. Um, but the data that you get from an elephant collar is absolute gold. Every hour of every day, you're seeing exactly where they're going to feed, to eat, to water, to sleep, to mate. Um, what happens in the dry season, how they move through the landscape. Without that data, we are flying blind for elephant conservation. So it's, a, it's an expensive, dangerous, tricky thing to do, but if you can get a collar on an elephant and keep it on, um, it is the most valuable thing we can do, to be honest. And, you know, working with elephants alive and save the elephants, we try and collar the same individuals for multiple years in a row. Collars. They vary, they can die after a year or five years. You're never really sure when the collar's going to run out. The materials are getting better um, slowly, um, but they're extremely expensive. So for us having partners, research partners, and tourism partners, and industry partners, and corporate partners coming on board to help donate that technology is super important. Um, and it's expensive, you know. Um, the collar itself is thousands of dollars, but it's actually the monitoring, the putting on of the collar, and then at least two to five years of monitoring that collar is what's expensive. So you know, it can be up to $10,000 to sponsor a collar for its, lifetime, for its lifespan. So the more people who want to donate and contribute, the better. Um, and it's really an exceptional tool for elephant conservation. Elephants has always been a really important species within our family. Um, we're always discussing elephants, and I just, I just love the idea that they're such a socially intricate species to study. And to me, they're these amazing connectors of the landscape, but also on an empathetic level, they, they are classified as sentient beings um, in that they can feel what another elephant is feeling. Hey guys, there's an elephant here. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Make a. Yes. 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 Elephants are the most important land mammal we have on Earth today, as far as I'm concerned. They are ecosystem engineers. They are responsible for some of our largest, most important rainforests, for our you know, biosphere in Africa, which is absorbing so much of the carbon which our entire planet is being heated up with right now. Um, they distribute seeds. They dig holes in the riverbed in the dry season for other animals to come in. They distribute tons of elephant dung across the landscape, which is an incredible fertilizer for so many plants. Um, and they are just a vitally important animal for the landscape, let alone the sentient beings that they are and the, the very existence that they have a right to live. And it's not just living, elephants living in, as individuals, they have to live as social groups. So when we're trying to conserve elephants, it's not about the individuals necessarily, it's about the structure of their families and enabling them to live as a whole. So um, that means bulls being allowed to come in and out of family units, um, matriarchs being allowed to grow up with their youngsters and their sisters and their nieces and nephews um, and enabling intact elephant groups to live um, in harmony in the landscape. Everybody back to the vehicles.
That was very different to the last experience. This was very kind of like in the moment we got to run. There's feels like what is a hundred people, everybody working at the same time. And the Ellie was also in a very tight spot of bush. So Ooh, that was crazy. Adrenaline rush, but very different to the last coloring. And then there was this other elephant that just came out of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Gave everyone a fright. You guys all right? Yeah, yeah we just ticks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> How did that go? Yeah. Perfect, actually. Super Wasn't quick. It? Yeah, super okay. quick. That's from the easiest accesses we've had for a long time. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> short to walk. Stop the car. I know. Small bull. Did you oh, get it? Did you get your blood? Breathing okay. Tons I of ticks. Yeah, yeah, it was never good. Ticks. Yeah. Yeah. The ticks are. Is this and, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they no, carry so many diseases. Oh, no. So, anyway, the vets have taken some samples, so hopefully they'll be able to tell if it's okay. No dodgy diseases. Anyway, he looked healthy. Got a good buddy looking out for him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is he really going to listen? They worried about us, they worried about the chocolate being hit. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed in that moment. I was like, I don't even know what I would do if the elephant. I wouldn't know what to do. But now the elephant just came in there. Yeah. Clap your hands and just shout. run faster than the person next to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The connectivity is absolutely essential for elephants. If you trap elephants in small reserves, you will end up with huge problems. They will destroy the trees, they will eat themselves out of house and home. And then as we're seeing in Southern Africa, we have problems with um, management of those small elephant populations. It's horribly controversial, very difficult to find solutions. We have to keep corridors open. We have to have that connectivity between game reserves, between private reserves, between community lands, natural forests, rivers. And that's what we're trying to do here in Mozambique is, you know, the invaluable elephant tracking data that Elephants Alive have discovered through these collared elephants has provided this powerful motivator to protect this entire landscape. So this is a really important mission. Um, the Mozambique Wildlife Alliance trying to help with the rapid response teams along the corridor. So it's essential that we all work together. None of us can do this on our own. Um, and the more organizations, the safari companies that come on board to help us, the better. So it's an open door, everyone needs to help now. Um, it's really a crisis. How was that compared to the last one? It's a bit it's more intense. intense, yeah, a bit more intense. Uh, so yeah, it was a good one. I got the adrenaline pumping a bit more, so all fun and games. And you? Also, the adrenaline is going, I mean, not even to look out for this animal waking up, but this chormuses in the felt here. Elephants are extraordinary animals. They are um, highly social, highly intelligent. They, when we talk about high intelligence, we're talking about an animal that is entirely sentient of its surroundings. So that means that it's aware of each other. They know each other's position in their family. Um, they know the characters of each other. They each have a particular character that comes out if you get to know them. So um, we have a long-term study of elephants, so we know that some have humor, some are naughty, some are rude, um, some are arrogant, some are really vicious. Um, and, you know, when I talk about humor, I, I literally mean elephants that joke with you. So you can be in a vehicle with one that's a, a young bull in Samburu that we know, he'll, he'll sidle up to the vehicle and throw things at you from outside and then run off. I mean, if that's not humor, you know, and that's, that's a very anthropocentric word, but it's, um, I don't see any harm in it. You know, we, we are dealing with an animal that is so conscientious. They remember individual humans that they've liked or been mistreated by. Um, and so they're incredibly special, important animals. And tied into that is their deep understanding and memory of the landscape. So they remember where an old waterhole was they went to when they were 12 years old and they're 25 now and they're like, but I remember that waterhole and it's very dry this year, I'm gonna take my family there. So a lot of other animals follow those tracks because of it. So they're extremely important, intelligent animals and they deserve to be left alone. Um, killing one individual elephant is absolutely catastrophic to its family and surroundings. Um, and so I know this idea that you can hunt individual bulls and it doesn't have a knock-on. It has a huge knock-on to their society. Individual bulls interact with different groups all the time. Um, and when you see a bull that's been out for a while and comes back into a female herd, they greet him with great, you know, hello, and they could be his brother, they could, he could be the father of their young ones, they'll remember that. 
Um, so taking out individual bulls is a terrible idea and they are incredibly important for that memory of the herd and for the, the, whole, um, the whole family network of elephants. Um, so hunting individual elephants is, is, a, is a really disastrous idea and if you take out the older bulls as well it also can allow the younger bulls to misbehave because it's literally like they're teenagers without an adult around. So they get very naughty, they push over trees, they push over rhinos, they can really cause um, a lot of problems. So enabling elephants to live in their natural structure is super important. Um, and the challenge is that they need so much space. So that's why we've got to have these corridors, this interconnectivity. Um, and the larger the landscapes we can do that with, the better. And if that means we have to give up some elephant areas in order to protect the larger connected areas, and that's what it's going to have to be in the future, um, we have a lot of challenges ahead to protect this animal. A lucky few of us got to ride back to the airstrip with Grant in the helicopter. What's your story? What's your sign? It's like we're twin flames in a different life. Deep connection, lights a spark It's like you know me in the depths of my heart We're dreamers So Save the Elephants is a pretty innovative research organisation and we base everything on research. So even if it's community-based work, we are do a lot of questionnaires, analysis, before and after anything, any interventions that we do. We're about to do a large-scale uh, screening of a particularly special film, elephant film across the whole of Kenya, um, called The Elephant Queen. Um, so that's really exciting for us. We're going to be going into 160 remote communities um, who are living next to elephants and filming elephants and educating the community around elephants and the importance to their habitat. During that whole screen, it's going to take about a year to do that. Um, so that's a big thing that's coming up right now. Um, education is fundamental um, and we're trying to boost our bursaries and support for the communities. Um, but the research that's going on, we're still doing fundamental elephant research, trying to understand the animal itself. Because unless we understand why they're eating, what they're eating, why they're drinking, what they're drinking, how they interact, what impact being uh, divided is on the social level of elephants, unless we know that, we, we can't be as committed as we are to all the work we're doing for the landscape protection. So there's just tons and tons going on, including the development of our toolbox, uh, we have this very important side to us called the Elephant Crisis Fund, which is the funding that's here supporting Mozambique right now. And the crisis is looking at anti-trafficking, anti-demand, anti-poaching and human elephant coexistence. So that's why I'm out here, is that particular drive that we have now to try and uh, stop the killing of elephants, but also now as we're stopping the killing, how do elephants live with people? So there's just so much happening. And the, the most important thing is these alliances, so working with each other. And I think in the olden days, NGOs used to work in silos a bit, and now everyone's piling in. And that's the, another positivity in the last few years, is just everyone's going, help each other. What skill do you have? What skill do I have? How do we share that? How do we pool resources? And again, this is why elephants are so critical, because they are landscape animals. So if we help these elephants en masse, we're also helping all the cascade of animal underneath. It's really hard to fundraise for impalas, you know, but if we protect that landscape, all those impalas will be safe as well. Um, and they're just as important, all the zebras, all the giraffe, all the chameleons. Um, it's so key. And if we have to use these large animals to do that, then that's what we're going to do. Um, How was that in terms of like the yes. flight and the darting that, that and stuff? That was the dream. Is it? <laughs> yeah, we packed fuel and everything for it to take like three hours and it took us 10 minutes. So, yeah, what a relief because it could have gone either way. This is open patches and then super thick forest. And we said if they go into the forest, then that's game over pretty much. So, yeah, very lucky that it all went according to plan. Awesome. Thank you so much yeah, and thanks for the pleasure. flip. Pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Do we see you later? 
Nope, I'm out of here now. I'm gonna put fuel in and then I'm going back to Karangani. So. Goodbye. Goodbye. Drive safe. Thanks. Take care. Back. Thanks, man. You too. Yeah. We see you, see you. We'll see you more soon. regularly. Eh? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Take Some care. Some more good trips. Fly safe. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Well done. Yeah. Yay. Thank you for being part of it. <laughs> no, thank you for letting me be a part of it. This is amazing. Did you see the other one in Limpapa? Yes. Ah. Fences for elephants are essential in some parts of the world um, and they are one of the tools in the toolbox of how to manage elephants. It's just a reality that you don't want elephants walking through Maputo Central High Street. You can't have elephants walking through Durban High Street. So at some point there is a, is a hard need for electric fences. Um, elephants and lions in particular are extraordinarily large dangerous animals that can kill people and kill people very messily. So fences are not the evil thing. What we don't like to see is um, fences completely blocking corridors, trapping animals into unnaturally small areas, um, and using fences to kind of excuse uh, bad practices like culling, um, which is you know, the most appalling thing you can do for elephants, families. Um, so fences are part of the tools, and the question is how can we use fences to the best of the ability to ke keep corridors open, if you can use semi-permeable fences in some way, like beehive fences are semi-permeable, so they stop elephants, but they don't stop goats and cows and dogs. Um, and livestock, the movement of livestock is really important across Africa. So how do you control elephants but enable livestock to move? It's a huge challenge. So the idea is not demonizing electric fences, it's about finding the right type of fence for the right scenario. And that's where this toolbox comes in. It's, it's every site is different. Um, but some fences are way more expensive than others, so it also depends on your budget. You know, we'd all love to have the most high, perfect beehive fence or the perfect electric fence, but when you're dealing with only having a few hundred dollars for a farmer um, or a few thousand dollars for a game reserve, we just don't have the budgets that's needed for the best solution all the time. So that's the trick. You know, how do we work in this world where there's not enough funding for conservation ever? We're all working on micro budgets. Um, we're doing the work that governments should be doing, um, and it's really hard to find the right solution within the right budget as well. Informal one. Informal one. Informal one. Same. Okay, if you can't see the camera, the camera can't see you. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is. Uh, a very fun day today. Um, I'm just actually looking at the people around me and these are a hell of a lot of people who do a hell of a lot of good for conservation out there. I'm really um, honoured and proud to be in this crowd. It is quite something and um, I don't think I'll ever forget this day. I think conservation has always been quite a protective industry and it's been very difficult to get involved in. That's something that's changing every day now. And the ability to get involved and get your hands dirty is becoming more and more of an option. And I would really encourage anyone who is even remotely interested in wildlife or wanting to learn more about conservation, then get involved in any way that you can. Reach out to a local NGO in your area and ask them if there's any way that you can come and help with their work or fundraise for what they're doing. And See what it is that they are doing on the ground, learn what their challenges are, and it will open your eyes in a whole new way as to what is going on to help save animals across Africa. Hopefully today will be the first day that we get into camp before dark. It is already 3.35, so we might not. <sighs> okay. I thought this doesn't feel quite right. That's not, <laughs> not the right weight. Okay. Let's do it. I think it's also important to remember that helping conservation isn't just about giving money. Giving your time, sharing your skills, or any kind of resources that you have um, can be enormously impactful. Iron Man, for example, supporting with vehicle gear, um, suspension, it helps in a way that I think a lot of people don't really put the two and two together on. Um, a lot of the operations with conservation projects is in remote areas and helping with 
resources can be equally as beneficial as assisting with a financial donation. Um, so don't discredit what you do or what you have to give. I would always just encourage you to reach out, speak to a different or speak to an organization and say, look, I do this or I produce that or this is my skill. Is it something that you can make use of? And here, Wild Wonderful World, we would be very, very happy to help coordinate that. You know, we are connected with a number of different NGOs and projects across Africa, and all of them very different, from community-based projects to anti-poaching to wildlife rehabilitation centers. And I mean, even things like porridge. <laughs> you wouldn't have thought that that would be an impactful thing to donate, but it makes a difference. Um, that would be for an elephant or rhino orphanage. They use porridge in their feeds. Um, so sometimes you think, you know, whatever it is that you're doing or whatever you can give might not necessarily be the right thing, but you'd be surprised. And I would just always encourage everybody to reach out and, you know, in, in whatever way that you can, you can make a difference. And as one person, you can make a difference. And I think that once I learned that, it's changed the way that I operate. It's very easy to be discouraged when it comes to conservation. The issues are massive and they aren't just going to go away with the click of a finger and they aren't going to go away with just one NGO pioneering incredible research. It's about teamwork and it's about everybody pulling together and if we all bring conservation and the protection of wildlife to the front of everything that we do, we would be living in a very different world. Okay, we didn't make it while the sun was still shining, but at least it's not dark. <laughs> at least it's not dark. It looks dark in our campsite, though. Are you going to pull through? Just pull through? No, just, just park here. Park. It's fine. Hello, campsite. Did you all have a wonderful day today? An uh, awesome day. Epic. There's a lot of complaining going on here. Oh, yeah. That's just ulti complaining, that's all. I don't know about what, about. <laughs> well, I reorganized my kit here on this back seat at night, like take all the camera batteries out and dump everything and work at it. And last night we were parked here as well. And these leaves are quite an issue. So I just had a little joke and I said, no, I'm gonna work in the tree again. <laughs> and then when I saw good old Dion, as he does, solved my problem. Oh, thank you, Dion. Saved my life as well. <laughs> Problem solver a thousand. You're really oh. good at cutting branches. Are yeah. we going to run for a sundown on our deck? Yes. Let's, let's, let's. let's, 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 let's <laughs> okay, drink check. What have you got? Gin and tonic. You? Unfortunately, nothing. So. Liar, liar, liar. Oh, it is. Oh, a Deutsch M. Deutsch M. Please, sir. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Cheers. Let's go. Cheers. 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 Cheers, you guys. Cheers. To an Ellie with a collar. Cheers. You cover us in shame and I take the blame. Living by the moves to which high school blues walk ahead. Driving here for the last almost 10 years, uh, it's one of the most beautiful places I've seen because it, it merges the typical savanna and forest landscape with the Indian Ocean, so it's quite unique. I would probably say it's probably the largest uh, waterberry forest you'll ever see. In, I mean, in, in this part of the world, so it's quite unique and beautiful. Uh, some people call this place the Serengeti by the ocean, and I completely agree with this with this expression. Conservation, it's such a multi-layered word. It, I mean, for me, because I work in that juxtaposition between wildlife and people, so it's not just about conserving wild animals, it's about conserving the interconnectivity of life in Africa. 
and Africa has always had people and animals overlapping. So for me it's about conserving a natural habitat, an environment where animals can live naturally and at peace, but not necessarily to the exclusion of people to such an extreme point where they start to resent those animals. And I think that's the trick. And in the modern world, we seem to have lost that aspect of humans interacting with nature in a positive way. Um, we are alive today because we benefit from nature uh, and we need nature. We need timber for building our houses and timber to burn for our fires. So we shouldn't be totally exclusive. The trick is, is that when one side of the equation is so powerful and so dominating, and in our case, human population is so ridiculously overpopulated that we are just consuming so much more than the natural world can protect. So we're gonna to have to stand on the side of the animals for a while and try and help protect that to such a level because if we don't, it'll be gone within two years. The construction, the extraction that's going on is just beyond anything that nature can bounce back from. So that's why we're so passionate about conservation because it's the, the, the balance is so totally unfair at the moment. It's just tipped way towards the humans. Um, and there's just so many of us. We're the most populous animal on the planet. So we've got to be looking at the last 7,000 cheetah that are left, the last 20,000 lions. There's only 400,000 elephants left. We've got, to, we've got to focus on that side of conservation right now. Um, but the ultimate dream is, of course, to have people and animals living in harmony together. Um, I don't know if it's possible anymore, to be honest. I think we might have reached that tipping point where more electric fences are going to have to go up until we redress that balance. really really important to us that our guests and donors are as part of the conservation project as possible it's not just about giving money and doing good it's about understanding where your money goes what the challenges on the ground are and to know that you're supporting the conservation of wildlife and wild spaces and exactly how so that's where we're at today with wild wonderful world We've been very, very fortunate to be involved with and support of a number of incredible conservation projects, especially in this last year. Um, COVID's been very difficult for a lot of the NGOs where funding has dried up. And luckily for us, we have actually managed to increase our funding, whereas our conservation safaris and general travel has, has obviously decreased with COVID. So, yeah, I think that we're incredibly grateful to the, the donors of Wild Wonderful World and to the people who are still traveling with us. Every single penny spent on safari, um, every bit of money that we, we make in profit goes straight into the trust. And one of the colors that we are, we are using on this Ironman conservation expedition has been money raised through our safaris. And um, it just goes to show that you know, if you can put your money uh, to traveling with purpose and traveling with a company like Wild Wonderful World, you're not just getting a trip of a lifetime, but you're making a difference just by traveling. So we're very proud of that. That was a really yummy breakfast and just the perfect way to end the perfect trip. It was so, so, so much fun. Do you guys want to come say goodbye? Sure. Thanks, Michelle, for bringing us out here. This was really awesome. Thank you all for joining. It's been an amazing couple of weeks, or almost mm. couple of weeks. And 
A big, big thank you to all of the projects that we connected with as well. Elephants Alive, Karangani, um, the, the work that they're doing on the ground is just so inspirational. And to the reserves themselves, Maputu Special Reserve, Limpopo National Park, and the amazing vets that we worked with as well. So Jao and Ugo, uh, we've all learnt so much. And a very big thank you to Iron Man as well. It's been such a such a fun 10 days with you all. It was and awesome. It was we've really tested awesome. the gear, we've given it all a huge thumbs up. It's definitely allowed us to get to the places that we've needed to be. It's been a fantastic trip. Yeah, yeah. it's been so much fun. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Say Cheers. goodbye. Bye. Bye. So for those of you who already subscribed to our YouTube channel, thanks so much. We really appreciate the support. If you don't and you enjoyed these videos, please do subscribe and remember to click the little notification bell so that you are notified when we drop a new video. So before I say goodbye, there's just one last thought that I want to leave you with. And it's a beautiful something that Dr. Lucy King said in her interview. And it's something that I've been thinking about ever since. And I'd like to just say goodbye with that message. Cheers. Yeah, every single person should be contributing right now because everyone's life is at stake right now. The air that we breathe is at stake. We're about to go into the Global Climate Change Conference in November, um, COP26, I think it is, and everyone's life is going to be impacted by this conference and the output. Um, the air pollution that we're breathing is now ridiculous in some of our cities. Major, major cities all over the world are having really bad air pollution. We're seeing um, humans being impacted by you know, cancers and lung disease because of the climate and pollution that we're sitting in. So no one can sit back anymore. Um, and it's not just about recycling your rubbish, which everyone presumably is doing by now, you know, and if not, why not? And there should be pressure on your local council to make sure there are recycling systems. That's a, the minimum we should be doing. But everyone should be supporting local conservation groups. They should be out planting trees. They should be looking at their own habitats, even of the local park that they're next to. You know, is there litter? Is the water clean? Is, are they planting trees? What can you do locally? You don't have to be collaring elephants to help conservation. That's really hard. But also look and think about your budget. Everyone should be contributing to charity. Pick a charity. Pick something that's doing something that balances humans and animals together. And it might not be elephants. It might be chameleons. It might be, I don't know, um, hyenas that grab your attention. But find something, pick something and follow it and help. Um, and I think people just identify something that you really care about. Um, and if it's something a little closer to home, like your local park or your beach, of course, the beaches along Southern Africa are so important. Go and pick up litter, because all those turtles need 50 people a day picking up litter along the coastline. So you can't just sit back and go, oh, the problems are too big. Everyone has to help now. And it's not just recycling your rubbish. It has to be way more than that. So I think this is where you know we're engaging kids and schools and universities, we're engaging ministers, we're engaging land planners, we're engaging absolutely everyone on the scale, um, all the way up to you know the, the head of the UN. Everyone has to be contributing. So until we everyone wakes up, and I think COVID is it's the one good thing about COVID has woken people up to the mess that our planet is in. The reason we're sitting here is because people have been eating wild animals that shouldn't be eaten. You know, the COVID is a mixture of of pangolin and bat, that's the DNA. So it's come from just this horrible mix of humans just devastating the environment. And this is the first of many, many coronaviruses, coronaviruses that we're gonna get. There've been more before, but none have hit the planet like this. So we are just sitting ducks if we don't do something about it. So yeah, the time is now, and if we don't do it now, we are screwed.